this is episode 254 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Muscle Regeneration with Dr. Helen Blau. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. I got Arun here in the studio today. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Stem Cell Podcast, rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Helen Blau, who's from Stanford University, Arun's alma mater. She's on the podcast to talk about her research on rejuvenating aged muscle stem cells and tissues. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news. That's coming right up. But first, and yes, we got a unique back-to-back situation here. We'd like to introduce Muscle Cell News, a free weekly newsletter provided by the Stem Cell Science News Program. Muscle Cell News summarizes all of the latest research news, jobs, and events in muscle cell research and delivers it right to your inbox every Monday. Save time and keep current with Muscle Cell News. Subscribe for free at www dot muscle cell news dot com we're gonna dive right into it with a really in my mind fun story i am biased by this story it's kind of what i'm what i'm into it's one of the things that inspired me to go into cardiac biology was of course you know the zebrafish right the zebrafish is just this amazing model system for studying not just heart development but all sorts of development regeneration a bunch of different applications right and when i saw this paper i was just it's just one of those, you know, beautiful, beautiful developmental biology stories that's answering, like, I think one of the most beautiful questions in developmental biology, a really simple question. And that's how does the heart actually start beating? So this is a nature paper titled A Bioelectrical Phase Transition Patterns the First Vertebrate Heartbeats. And yeah, they're using the zebrafish as their model system to study the first heartbeat in the zebrafish. Um, and part of the reason you can do it, of course, is because zebrafish is so optimized for optical imaging. You can see right through it. And they've got this really cool custom calcium reporter zebrafish that they used here to actually track that first heartbeat. So we know the heartbeat is critical to vertebrate life, right? So in the mature heart, the, the function is driven by the, that pacemaker, the pacemaker population that actually drives the electrophysiological activity in the rest of the heart. But in contrast, the pace banking capability is actually pretty broadly distributed in the early embryonic heart. And this is pretty well established both in mammalian and zebrafish hearts, but it raises the question of how that initial beat actually happens and how that tissue scale activity is first established and then ultimately maintained during embryonic development. I, I, for one, I, I'm actually pretty shocked that no one's actually studied something like this before. But I think part of the reason is, you know, having all these really cool optical reporters that we have now enables us to do this sort of work, I think, in, in greater depth. So that initial transition of the heart from silent, you know, nothing contracting at all, to beating has never really been characterized at the time scale of an individual electrical event. So this is a really fine-tuned electrophysiology story more than anything. And, uh, you know, the the structure and the space and time of the early heartbeats is pretty poorly understood. So what they did is all optical electrophysiology, again, combined with a really neat custom fluorescent reporter, calcium reporter, uh, zebrafish line here to actually capture the very first heartbeat of a zebrafish. And if you're not on social media, if you're not on Twitter, then maybe you haven't seen some of these videos, but, you know, they've been plastered all over uh, social media. They've really caught the public's imagination. Just, you know, just some beautiful imaging of just an all black zebrafish heart, nothing really going on at all. And all of a sudden you had that initial pulse, right? Your heart starts beating only, you know, it starts beating only once in your life. So it's such a powerful, beautiful event. And it's really cool that they're able to, to capture this. But then they characterize it a little bit further and uh, analyze the development of the cardiac excitability and the conduction around that singular event, that first heartbeat. And the, what they saw is actually pretty consistent in the zebrafish, at least. The first few beats appeared suddenly. It's not like there was a, a population in the heart that initially started beating, and then there's another population that started beating. They all just pulsed all at once, which is really pretty cool. Um, 
But the the first few beats had somewhat irregular inner beat intervals. So they had not an arrhythmia, but you know, they weren't beating as they they would when the cells become more mature. But over time, just over a few seconds really, that um irregular inner beat interval stabilized and propagated coherently across that primordial heart. And there there was um even though the entire heart you know pulsed all at once, they were able to identify a certain locus that apparently initiated that electrophysiological pulse. Uh, that location of that locus actually varied from animals and also over time. So that was something that the, was a really cool observation that they made. Um, they also did some mathematical modeling of the electrophysiology and the action potential durations and the upstrokes and all that good stuff. But I think in general, this is just a uh, there, I think the reason that this is a, a nature paper is is the the imaging modalities that they're using to answer this really simple fundamental question that's pretty universal across developmental biology, no matter what organism you study. And that's how does the heart start beating? And the question I have next is, you know, can you extend some of these observations? And how conserved are these observations across? you know, going from zebrafish to to, to mice and humans and all that kind of stuff. But just, you know, a beautiful, beautiful imaging story that's answering a really fundamental question in developmental biology. Yeah, I, I, I really like this story and I could see why it's a nature story because it's like really inspiring, right? It's like a, a experimental study that a poet would design answering one of those existential questions like this, like what is the, the first spark of life and what drives it? Um, and, you know, it's it's a question I think a lot of people have had. So I, I'm with you on how how come it's not been done before. But I can see why when you look into the paper uh, to 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 come to an answer and some conclusions with any rigor. Yeah, the, the amount of technology they have to deploy is pretty impressive from the electrophysiology to the math, even not to mention all the reporters and you know, molecular biology, this is this is a, an observation that's been built on decades of tool making. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, my question from it would be extending it to, to maybe higher mammals, etc, or different mammals, I don't want to get pejorative there. <laughs> but uh, the the other question I would have, and I'm afraid the answer is kind of disappointing is like, how can you use this clinically? And like maybe one idea would be like, oh, well, if you can figure out what drives the first heartbeat, maybe you could like get some insight on how to restart a stopped heart. But like the reality is we're talking about a completely different animal, right? I mean, you you know the heart backwards and forwards in and out. And like, is there any kind of relevance of an observation that's made at that first, you know, this is the first organ, uh, that primordial, you know, onlage. If, if you have a heart, you know, mechanism going on at that stage is it at all applicable to a mature heart i don't know so a uh, clinical relevance you know who cares though really right because this is one of those studies where it, it, it's the the clinical relevance comes kind of after the fact accidentally this is one of those basic studies where you don't know how it's going to impact you just know that's an important question to answer and something that we've been seeking you know answers we've been seeking for since the beginning yeah, I mean, in terms of the clinical application, I agree with you. It's kind of it's far fetched to think about how this would be directly translatable. And one thing I was thinking about was the developmental analog going from you know in vivo to in vitro, because say like in what I do, which is IPS cardiomyocyte differentiation, that's a that's a parallel, right? You're using the same developmental pathways to create cardiomyocytes in vitro that are immature, that will that are you know fetal in all. Uh, intents and purposes. And maybe you could track the initial heartbeat in an in vitro culture as well. In fact, I've, I'm, again, shocked that no one's done something like that. Hmm. You know, actually visualize that first contraction of IPS cardiomyocytes in, in the culture. I've seen a million IPS cardiomyocyte papers, and we know that these things start beating at approximately day seven of differentiation. But I don't think anybody's actually done that initial characterization. Maybe you have to write a grant about that. I don't know. <laughs> Get after me, I love it. Uh, this is what happens when we go back to back. Um, yeah, now, as you're saying it, I'm like, oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, cardiac organoids. You know, I think making hearts in, in a dish out of stem cells is, is a long way off, but 
this information has got to be useful along those lines if you want to do it in a coordinated way that matches physiology yeah you got to know what the what the real deal is so a nice ground truth for uh you and your future well-funded lab Arun <laughs> remember where it came from partner put me on there as a co I. um anyway we're talking about the heart and the famously this is we always lament the heart doesn't regenerate except in these dang zebrafish and other organisms you know regeneration the capacity for regeneration it's it's there and a lot of uh you know species across the animal kingdom but uh in mammals unfortunately for us the heart does not regenerate and not much else does besides the liver um but among vertebrates the axolotl still have trouble saying that I don't know why but uh the axolotl is an exceptional example of a regenerative um organism it can regrow pretty much all the body parts not all of them a lot of them. limbs spinal cord eyes uh parts of the heart even the brain I mean come on if I could start over with a new brain sign me up um <laughs> but you know using limb generation that's the classic people love to look at axolotl limb regeneration as like a, a, a primo model um and the way that works is you get these blastema that form and are comprised of mesenchymal progenitors uh, just at the tip of that stump there um they expand differentiate and then pattern to reconstitute fully functional limb like nothing ever happened uh and there's been previous work by uh Maximina Yoon who's at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden Germany and Dr. Yoon's group previously had shown that in addition to this whole regenerative, all these cells regenerate to form a perfect, you know, replica, there's also this uh, induction of cellular senescence in a subset of cells within the blastema um, and in surrounding tissues. Uh, and as we know, you know, senescence, when you hear senescence, you, you don't usually hear it, uh, you know, right next to regeneration um senescence is like a state of growth arrest and we, we talk about it in the context of aging that it's like these zombie cells that just hang around and you just you know cause trouble they're not doing anything constructive um but you know the 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 reality is uh and Dr Yoon's group and others have shown that there's actually a role for senescence in some beneficial processes you know uh tissue repair wound healing and embryo embryogenesis um even in tumor suppression um and the the key there in these be beneficial forms of senescence is that they're transient right uh and when you have the transient senescence uh that's constructive when it gets dysregulated oftentimes you get this inappropriate maladaptive activity of the senescent cells and that i think is what we've talked about a lot on the show about you know the senolytic approaches and getting rid of these zombie cells so really senescence in and of itself isn't necessarily bad um it can be a part of constructive processes but when it does go bad you get these zombies and age-related diseases um so in the context of the axolotl these senescent cells appear and then are later eliminated hence the transients and that constructive effect um but reproducibly repeatedly you amputate the same limb these poor axolotls and it keeps coming back um and it's always uh, coincides with this little senescent subset right um so it's it's a part of the program um uh but the role of cellular senescence in this context and others is not really well understood so that's what uh Maximina's group uh went after with this study it's a developmental cell sum you know get big up to dev, dev cell again I'll expect <laughs> my brown envelopes stuffed with single dollar bills at the end of the month uh <laughs> just kidding we are not for sale on the show um but I love dev cell so we're giving a little big ups right here and and it's a great story that gets to a fundamental question about the beneficial role of senescence and what they did here is they use gain and loss of function that axolotl which isn't easy you know we're not talking about the, the typical mice here it's uh tough to work with but they did it um and they show that the the the, the senescence is indeed uh critical to this axolotl uh generation and the way it works it creates this pro proliferative niche um that supports the you know expansion and then patterning of those progenitor cells um and the outgrowth of the blastema and here mechanistically which I think is what brought it to the level of, of dev cell 
is that they show the wind is a factor. I know wind's involved in a lot of things, but here I thought it was a neat kind of feedback mechanism where the link between wind and senescence induction was that the wind signals uh, facilitate the proliferation of the neighboring cells by preventing the induction into, into senescence. So if you inhibit wind, you get this you know little senescent subset, and then that subset then informs the other blastema cells to not become senescent and proliferate. So I think it's a nice, I love these kind of feedback. You know, it's the key of uh, most biological mechanisms. You have a nice little feedback mechanism and here it is. Uh, and what I love about it is it incorporates and juxtaposes this senescent, you know, non-dividing component and this highly proliferative component, which I think has a really nice symmetry. Arun, what's your take on that? I know you love the axolotl. Second only to the zebrafish, but tell me, what do you think about this? That's right. My second favorite model system behind the zebrafish is it is, and this is just a reflection of just how powerful this is as a model system for regeneration. I think in my mind, it's probably the best model system out there for regeneration because I guess the the newt and the salamander are not as popular, I suppose, right? But you're right. I mean, it's a really unique observation. Wint, who knew, right? I mean, that's feels like wint has a role in everything. But the, the thing that came up for me immediately was just how well conserved a mechanism might, like this might be across other uh, you know, species that have similarly high regenerative capacity like the, the newt or the salamander. So uh, DevCell, we're a big fan here, and um, I need to look up who the editor-in-chief is. We'd love to have you on the show. We're like 15 minutes in the show. All we're talking about is newt salamanders, axolotls, and zebrafish. What the heck, man? <laughs> we're trying to cure diseases here, partner. But uh, I guess we're going to come around to it. Uh, and that's all I got to say. We're bring it up to the next, the third story, please. <laughs> sure. We're going to move into something uh, a little bit more commonplace here on the show, and that's actually uh, a cell metabolism story coming from a friend of the show, Shubing Chen, and someone who is very, very well known in biomedical research, Francis Collins, the former director of the NIH and uh, he of Human Genome Project fame. So Dr. Chen and Dr. Collins have been collaborating here, which is kind of cool to see. This is a cell metabolism story, and we're bringing it back to pluripotent stem cells. Um, first author here is Dongsheng Shu. The title of the story is Functional Interrogation of 20 Type 2 Diabetes Associated Genes Using Isogenic human embryonic stem cell-derived beta-like cells. So you can see how this collaboration happened, right? I mean, Shubing Chen is a, an expert in all things pancreatic beta cell differentiation. And of course, Dr. Collins has an expertise in all things genetic screening and genetics and genomics, and right? So it's a, it's a great match here. It's a, it's a pretty brute force paper that I got, I got to say that they did here. Um, and a variety of genetic studies over the last many years have actually identified a number of different loci associated with type 2 diabetes. And I'll get to some of the caveats of the story in, in, a, in a bit, but we'll focus on the genetic side of type 2, which, as we know, has a huge non-genetic side too, right? But that's I guess that's one of the things we can talk about with the limitations down the road. But so even though they have these numerous loci associated with type 2 diabetes, the functional roles of these loci uh, are largely unexplored. So here what they did, like I said, a lot of brute force genetic engineering here via CRISPR. Uh, they engineered isogenic knockout human embryonic stem cell lines for 20 genes associated with type 2 diabetes risk. So just homozygous knockouts, I don't even think they did the heterozygous versions of the line. They just straight up knocked out these 20 candidate genes and just wanted to see what happens when it came to beta cell differentiation, function, insulin production, and survival. So they did a bunch of transcriptomic analysis, gene expression analyses, even chromatin accessibility profiling on these beta cells derived from every single knockout line. And again, I, I just can't emphasize enough how much work this is and it makes sense that it's a cell metabolism paper, right? So they analyze these uh, type 2 diabetes association signals that are overlapping some of the specific HNF4-alpha dependent ATAC-seq peaks. So they actually did some ATAC-seq and actually identified that there's a causal variant at the FAIM2 gene, uh, which is a type 2 diabetes association signal. All right. And then they did a bunch of other analyses, transcriptomic analyses, crossing with epigenomic analyses to identify four more genes 
uh, CP, RNase 1, PCSK 1N, and GSTA 2. I don't really know what the function of these genes are, except for the RNAs, I suppose. Um, but these genes are apparently associated with insulin production. And then there's other genes like Taglin 3 and DHRS2 that are associated with beta cell sensitivity to lipotoxicity. Okay. So, you know, basically they were, uh, they had these initial hits of these 20 loci, and then they just eliminated them to see what's the impact on pancreatic beta cells. Okay. Straightforward enough, just a lot of brute force. Right. And then finally, like I said, they leveraged a ton of ATAC seq deep ataxy, looking at chromatin uh, accessibility to um, identify allele specific imbalance, a different heterozygous. So actually they did, sorry, they actually did do heterozygous here as well. Uh, and then identified a single likely functional variant at each of the 23 uh, type 2 diabetes association signals. So this is a, a tour de force. It really is. It's interrogating candidate genes that are known to be associated with type 2 diabetes, really breaking down at a functional level, um, you know, and I'll come back to the caveat that I had at the very beginning here. And they actually mentioned this in their discussion section. Yeah, I mean, there's a functional component and a genetic component to type 2 diabetes, but as we know, there's a massive massive environmental component to this disease in contrast to type 1 which is you know pretty established that it's a you know genetic genetically modified uh, disease and less of a uh, environmental influence type 2 definitely much more of an environmental influence here combined with all the the usual caveats associated with pluripotent stem cells the immaturity of the beta cells but hey i think you know uh, I think that the beauty is in the the brute force analysis here. And I think also the generation of the data sets that will be really useful for other folks who are in the type 2 diabetes research field, the pancreatic beta cell differentiation field. Who knows? Maybe even Doug Melton could use some of this data for, for his work at Vertex as well. I don't know. Doug Mel Melton is just chilling on a beach somewhere. All right. <laughs> so he's, he's not using anything. Sure. Uh, <laughs> no, he's actually probably grinding still. He can't get enough. Um I want to just first uh, agree, yeah, uh, this is a heavy, heavy lift, and I want to give some props to Tings Out, who uh, is second to last on this and runs the core at MSK. As you said, the stem cell core, the amount of targeting and culture and phenotypic screening of, of these lines is tremendous, um, and she does great work with all the tri-institutes. I've worked with her myself, so props to you, Ting. You're killing it. Uh, congratulations on this. Also, uh, I, I want to say, yeah, about the type two thing. When I when I saw the title, I was like, huh? Um, but as you said the, and described there, there's a clear phenotype there. So what it says to me is that, yeah, while there's a there's a huge environmental component that, you know, you could argue maybe these people are teetering, right? Or they're at a dis disadvantage or they're, you know, at risk, however you want to call it. Um that's information that I think is actionable, right? Already, we talk about A1C and people who are pre-diabetic and there's there's ways that you can intervene. So imagine if you have people like right out of the gate, you, and this is a little bit dystopian, I don't love it as a, as a world to live in, but like right out of the gate, you're like, well, you're, you're at whatever latent risk, occult risk of this, that, the other. I think that this is a type of, of study that can really definitively address it on a gene by gene basis, as opposed to like IPS. It's just amazing how 10 years ago, even we're like, oh, IPS, this is now we're going to be able to do all these things and understand all these things about disease susceptibility, et cetera. And then cut to a decade later, and it's like, yeah, well, who needs IPS? We're just going to do isogenic knockout 50 genes and, and, and screen each one. So this is amazing how, how the tech has arrived at a, you know, real clinical import uh and an actionable conclusion here um and something that honestly wouldn't it wouldn't have crossed my mind to start looking at type 2 diabetes and, and susceptibility at all as you you started by saying so i was very impressed with this study yeah it's one of those stories that's also just a reflection of the technology that's just emerged in the field over the last 20 years it's really astounding something like this is just, would simply have been impossible 20 years ago I mean, this is happening thanks to CRISPR, thanks to pluripotent stem cell differentiation, to pancreatic beta cells, which has been refined by Melton and colleagues and Shubing Chen and everybody. I guess, you know, Shubing Chen formerly being in the Melton lab kind of makes sense, right? Um, but this, and in combination with all the ATAC sequencing, the 
cheap cost of genomic sequencing, thanks in large part to the endeavors of Dr. Collins and, and friends. Um, that's all enabling a study like this to to really happen. And yeah, you know, type 2 diabetes is one of those diseases where it's it's not a single genetic locus that's actually driving the disease. And so the interrogation of a bunch of loci like this could be really useful and you can extend this to potentially something like cardiovascular disease. As we know, cardiovascular disease has a genetic component and a an environmental component. But I don't know. You get, it, to me, and maybe I'm I'm just biased or my views on this have changed over time. I feel like, you know, the environmental component for both type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, I I feel like it's heavier. It's heavier than the genetic component. Because if you're sitting there and eating like 50 Big Macs every day, you're going to get heart disease and type 2 diabetes, right? It doesn't matter what your genetics are. <laughs> well, if you make it through that day with the 50 Big Macs at all, <laughs> I think that you're, something's going to happen down the line. Um, but yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I would, I, which is why I don't love the idea of being like, Hey, you have this, you know, variant watch out for type two diabetes. I'd be more like, Hey, stop at big back number 10. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent on that. And I loved your, the earlier comments too, about the culmination of all the Doug Melton and Francis Collins and all converging on the tech. It really is such an awesome arc and being at this point in my career, midpoint, I guess, sadly, uh, it's nice to see how far we've come and I'm so excited about how far we have to go. And I'll tell you where we end up. It's going to be all about endothelium. I love endothelium. I love hematopoiesis. I'm not going to apologize. This, I think, because the story just keeps getting deeper. This is a story about lymphatics, and lymphatics have gotten a lot of run lately because, you know, people thought of it as like the third underappreciated endothelial type behind the arterial venous. But, you know, it's real. You, know, you need those lymphatics, and they're instructive, it turns out. But this is actually more about the skull uh, and the role of lymphatics in the skull, in particular in the meninges. All right. So the meninges are a uh, multi layered structure uh, that lie between the skull or the calvaria, the, the bone, bony part of the skull, and the brain. Um, and the meninges are composed of three la layers, which are the dura, arachnoid, and the pia maters, right? Uh, the dura mater uh, contains skull progenitor cells, um, and those contribute to that skull bone, the calvarial bone development and injury repair, homeostasis. Um, and they, in, in, as, as neonates, the, the, those skull bones, they're separated by these fibrous joints called the cranial sutures. Uh, and those sutures allow for postnatal skull expansion to accommodate brain growth. You know, it's, the brain grows like gangbusters in that first year. Um, and these meninges, they have a lot of different cells. They have fibroblasts, they have these skull progenitor cells that I just mentioned, but they also have a lot of you know, blood immune cells and lymphatic vessels. They have lymphatic vessels there that um, is necessary for drainage. Unlike other organs, the parenchyma of the brain doesn't have conventional lymphatic vessels within, you know, the parenchyma of the brain. Um, and so the way that the, the you get fluid exchange there is the space between the blood vessels and the brain tissues. Um, it, they, it's used in order to passage cerebral spine spinal fluid in and to get this interstitial fluid out. Um, and then there's the role of the meningeal lymphatics, right? And they function for drainage. Okay. So you need that in order to help remove the brain waste, of course, uh, which is important for neurocognitive function. Um, and also to uh, reduce that intracranial pressure that can build up. Um, uh, because, you know, the Sometimes you'll get this intracranial pressure uh, following from what's called craniosynostosis, okay? And this is a congenital craniofacial disorder that's not common, but not totally uncommon. One in 2,000 to 2,500 human births um, are affected by this craniosynostosis, and it's effectively a premature fusion of those cranial sutures, right? So the brain locks in, um, and then you get this dysmorphology of the skull, of course, and craniofacial uh, dysmorphology, but also in a sub subset because the, you know the brain fusion, there's pressure of of on the brain, and that can cause some neurocognitive dysfunction 
in a subpopulation of these of these patients. Um, and it's thought to be increased cranial pressure primarily, which is kind of like an insult on the brain there that mediates these uh, neurocognitive defects. But also there's the idea that, you know, it might be drainage. You need drainage uh, out of the brain to get rid of those negative influences and keep the nerve, keep things clean, um, so to speak. Uh, but in, in the current mainstay treatment for this craniosynostosis right now is surgery. Um, and the problem with that is, you know, brain surgery. It's pretty invasive. Uh, a lot of bleeding. These are young, young patients, super risky. Um, and also, oftentimes, you get these calvarial bones that refuse. Uh, it gets this re Um, So you got to go back in there. I mean, it's horrible. I can't imagine for these families. Um, so here's the thing. John Fu Chen, who's at the USC, her lab, or his lab, my apologies, established this animal model of neurological deficits of this craniosynostosis. They use these twist uh, one heterozygous knockout mice, which I don't know the details there, that recapitulates the, the phenotype of this craniosynostosis. I guess it, it's, it's a similar gene defect that mediates the craniosynostosis in humans. Um, but here's the thing. They were able to get this biodegradable scaffold, which they imbued with the, those skull progenitor cells. Uh, and they pretty much made, they re, re uh, renewed that cranial suture. Uh, and that was able to uh, bear out on a on a reduced neurocognitive and behavioral deficit in these mice. So it's a major step forward uh, in that there's an intervention here that's non-surgical that may work. Uh, but the question is, how the heck does the these cells that they put in there, they, these GLE-1 positive uh, skull progenitor cells, how do they exert that benefit? Is it just like allowing the brain and creating more skull progenitor cells? Who knows? Um, what they found in this uh, cell stem cell story is that it actually is done by two two mechanisms. They show that there is, yes, indeed, that the the you can reduce that intracranial pressure because the skull will correct. It'll become, you know, it'll be able to expand along the suture again. But the other thing is, which I love, is that uh, the other way it, it mediates the effect is by promoting growth of lymphatics. Um, and the the key interesting mechanism here is that it's it dependent on those SPCs, those skull progenitor cells, which secrete vascular endothelial growth factor type C. And VEGFC is like very specific for lymphatic induction and growth. Um, so yeah, another kind of crosstalk and feedback here where you have a, a deficit or insult, which can be uh, addressed by introducing a cell type that not only creates a cell of interest, in this case, the calvarial cells and remodeling the skull itself, but also creates these lymphatics, right? And, and here's the other really nice mechanistic element here is that they didn't even really have to put in those cells. They could just put in VEGFC, which is what those SPC cells make. And that was able to rescue some of the deficits uh, from intracranial pressure. Um, and improve the neurocognitive function. So a hack here where with the actual practical, clinically practical means, although I don't know how effective it would be in humans, um, you could treat these patients with VEGFC. And, and the other part of it that's not in the story, which I wonder is that, you know, given the crosstalk of all these cells in this system and every system, I wonder, and I truly believe angiocrine boss <laughs> that these lymphatics have got to be secreting something in and of themselves to have some crosstalk back on those spc so the spcs are making the veg fc and i think those lymphatics aren't just providing drainage but are also probably inductive and having an angiocrine function within this kind of pairing system so there's so many things here i think to follow up on but bottom line is that this is, and that's probably why it's CSC, is this is like a therapeutic almost. You could imagine with these patients, it's not so uncommon. Rather than go in there with the blunt instrument of brain surgery, or at least in addition to that, maybe you could provide a better outcome with just VEGFC. Um, and ultimately, with uh, cell-based therapy is what I hope, which I hope is not not very far off from what we've been seeing in all these stories that are ready for phase one. Yeah, this is really cool. I mean, this is an area of study that I I knew very little about before looking into this paper. Skull progenitor cells, I honestly had no idea about that particular population. 
Um, but you're right. I mean, this is a very unique approach for craniosynostosis. And I, while you were reading the 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 roundup paper there, I was under the assumption that this was a really rare, rare disease. And so I looked it up, but it's about one in 2000, which is not that rare. It's actually kind of common. And um, this is so devastating for for newborns, right? So I, I agree. I, I don't think this, you know, VEGFC approach is going to completely replace the surgical intervention, but I think it could be a nice addendum to the surgery or, you know, supplement to the, to, to the surgery to help restore um, proper function here. So I think this is really cool. I hope that Sherry Gur Cohen is listening because she's got an expertise in all things lymphatics and lymphatic regeneration. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really unique approach to potentially treating craniosynostosis here. Yeah, and a little plug for our upcoming conversation with Blue Rock. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot in preparation for that live podcast, which I hope some of you will get to and I hope all of you will listen to, is that this is, uh, it must be so great to be a neurosurgeon, in this case, talking about Dr. Vivian Tabar, who's been using this relatively blunt instrument. And in that case, for Parkinson's disease, you know, therapies like deep brain stimulation when pharma is not working and how you're moving from these systems to cells. And I think every disease now, even these ones that are really like mechanical, this is a mechanical, a steric hindrance here. The skull is closed. You need to open it up, but there's no reason not to to use every arrow, right? And I think that the the cells, the the you know biologics and the knife um, in combination ultimately is going to lead to much, much better prognoses, uh, much less invasive. Uh, and that's the future that we were promised. Uh, and that's the future that, that's coming about, I think, as that conversation in a couple of weeks will reveal. Really exciting roundup today. I love how we've come full circle from amphibians that who cares if they can regenerate their hearts to our brains, which ultimately we hope will stay intact for the long term. So we brought it back to center here, clinical application. But most important, what we talk about on the show is basic science translational science, and the most cutting edge of the type. Uh, we have a great interview with a legend in the field. I mean, she pretty much invented the idea of going uphill on Waddington's diagram. Uh, I don't want to give her too much credit, but she, you could make the argument. Um, that's going to be coming right up. But before we get there, I have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. Do you work with skeletal muscle progenitor cells? The Stem Cell Technologies human myocult workflow supports your muscle research from start to finish allowing you to derive, expand, and differentiate human skeletal muscle progenitors. You can also expand mouse myogenic progenitors using the mouse myocult expansion medium. Learn more at www.stemcell.com slash myocult. All right, folks, on today's episode, we have a true legend in the field, Dr. Helen Blau, who is the Donald E. and Delia B. Baxter Foundation Professor and Director of the Baxter Laboratory for Stem Cell Biology at Stanford University. Dr. Blau's research focuses on the basic molecular mechanisms of muscle stem cells and their application to aging, regenerative medicine, and disease. Her lab aims to understand and apply biology to improve quality of life, and their current primary focus is on understanding the gerozyme, 15-PGDH. Dr. Blau, thank you so much for joining us on the Stem Cell Podcast today. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks for being here, Dr. Blau. It's, um, it's really an honor. I mean, of course, your lab focuses on the, the mechanisms of stem cells and muscles and their applications to aging, regenerative medicine, disease, like what Dalen alluded to. And for many years now, your lab has examined the role of muscle stem cells in particular in regeneration and how we might be able to reju rejuvenate or reactivate muscle stem cells to combat, say, sarcopenia and other muscle wasting diseases. And there's been just so much that's been happening in your lab over the last few years in this area. And I know you actually recently just had a paper come out this week. So could you start off with an overview of where we are right now and how we might be able to harness or mechanistically manipulate muscle stem cells to combat these aging related muscle diseases. So tell us the current state of the art right now in this field. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, as you know, discoveries are largely serendipity. <laughs> and I think one of the most important ones that I've made recently is an example of that. And that's the discovery of what I call a gerozyme. 
it's uh, an enzyme that increases in its levels and expression with aging. And uh, what's fascinating about it is that you can target it to rejuvenate the tissue and rejuvenate muscle function. So the gerozyme is an enzyme that, uh, it's the prostaglandin degrading enzyme and it controls the levels of prostaglandin E2, for instance. And uh, what we find is that as you age, uh, your muscles have less prostaglandin E2. And one of the first discoveries we made in 2017 about this uh, was that prostaglandin E2 is essential for the function of muscle stem cells. Uh, if you genetically ablate the receptor EP4, in the stem cells. Then after an injury, the muscles regenerate, but they really struggle to regenerate. And uh, after a few weeks, uh, you can see a huge difference in the strength. They just can't meet the needs uh, to repair the damage. And uh, in addition, if you give a mouse an NSAID, an, um, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent that blocks the endogenous PGE2 synthesis pathway, then after a, a muscle injury, again, the stem cells cannot meet the need and regenerate the muscle and strength declines. They can't restore that strength. So PGE2 is absolutely required. It's essential for the function of the stem cells, allowing them to expand, increasing uh, their viability. In particular, we found that it it targets and enhances uh, viability of the cells. So um, a decline in that leads to dysfunction with aging. And when we first published that, the New York Times picked it up and wrote an article. There was an article on the, on the front page, no pain, no gain. Uh, and that's a major lesson from this work, which is that if you take an NSAID like ibuprofen after you run a marathon or you work out in the gym when you're feeling achy, then you're negating the good you did. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is that uh, the stem cells can't meet the damage because what you do when you do exercise is you have micro tears, you have micro damage to the muscle fibers. And that's a good thing. That's how you build muscle. But if you uh, block your endogenous PGE2 synthesis, which is your body's natural healing mechanism, then you negate the good you did. Mm. And uh, that was our first inkling of the potency of this. Then we decided to look further because we realized that we were seeing a, a dramatic effect on muscle fibers. And that suggested maybe the PGE2, prostaglandin E2, is having more of an effect than just on stem cells. So uh, we examined the muscle fibers and we found that it also acts on the receptors, EP4 receptors on muscle fibers. And uh, that it um, is essential to, or is capable of rejuvenating, restoring the function of aged muscle fibers. And it does so through stimulating mitochondrial function, mitochondrial number, and inhibiting TGF beta signaling, including myostatin, and, and also inhibiting the ubiquitin ligases, the enzymes that increase with aging that degrade your muscle proteins. Hmm. So it counters many different processes that are associated with muscle wasting in aging. And this muscle wasting with aging is, is really a, a, a major problem. It's about 30% of people over the age of 80 have sarcopenia, which is severe muscle wasting that leads to frailty, that leads to uh, increased falls and accidents, which then uh, leads to immobilization and then assisted living and it's a downward spiral, uh, early morbidity. So yeah. paying attention to that is really important. And humans, after the age of 50, lose 10% of their muscle mass per decade. So if we could find a way to counter that, it would be major. And what we have found is that if you 
uh, counter the activity or you block, inhibit the activity of the gerozyme, the prostaglandin degrading enzyme, you have a dramatic effect in restoring muscle function in aging. In mice, we hope that that translates to people as well as it is in mice. Uh, but what we see is, is a 10 to 15% increase in muscle strength with a short one month treatment, which is uh, quite remarkable. Yeah, remarkable and practical is, is what I thought when I first uh, heard you talk about this at the ISSCR this past summer. Uh, but we're going to circle back to that in a future question. I, I want to go back a bit farther than the summer. I want to go back, I mean, hate to age you here, but about 40 years. All right. So I'm going to read a portion of the introduction of a paper you published about 40 years ago. You wrote, once a cell is determined, quote, sorry, once a cell is determined, it is generally destined for specialization along a specific pathway. The option to generate other phenotypes no longer exists for the determined vertebrate cell, and its progeny stably inherit its limited potential. So that was the dogma that you were quoting there, pretty much Waddington's diagram in a nutshell. You then proceeded to level that longstanding dogma and lay out what is arguably, in my, in my view, a, a cornerstone of the modern era of stem cell biology, you used heterokaryons of muscle and non-muscle cells to show that, and I'm quoting here from the discussion, gene expression in cells specialized for very different functions is not fixed and irreversible. You also stated, quote, changes in gene expression depend not only on the nucleus, but also the cytoplasm. These were radical ideas at the time. And these heterokaryons were, in essence, an early example of SCNT, somatic cell nuclear transfer, you could say, uh, which was implemented about 10 years ago by Ian Wilmot, may he rest in peace, uh, to generate Dolly, thereby setting the stage for induced pluripotency and our modern era of patient-specific cells and tissues, which, I mean, we can't stop talking about on this show. What an amazing era uh, to be in science cell biology. So two questions here. Were those results so long ago uh, in a much different time, um, received with great skepticism, can you recall? And and second, <laughs> do you have any inkling then of the extent to which terminally differentiated fates could be reversed? Like, I think you were had doubting the dogma, but did you think you could go all the way back? <laughs> Thank you for that. That question, yeah, I guess it was pretty gutsy as an assistant professor to decide to work on this as my first research endeavor. Uh, but it was a, a problem I'd been thinking about as a postdoc. I really wanted to know. The dogma was that the differentiated state was fixed and irreversible. And it seemed to me that um, I didn't see why that had to be. And so I wanted to test it and see whether there was plasticity in differentiation. And as you said, when we fused muscle cells with an increased gene dosage in a syncytium that didn't allow for uh, loss of chromosomes due to cell division, we were able to um, induce or activate gene expression in non-muscle cells. And the key thing was showing that this could occur in the absence of cell division because other experiments before us were complicated by the fact that the chromosomes were eliminated or suppressed. And uh, this way you could really prove that there was gene activation. Silent genes were, were activated that had been previously silent and that you could change that differentiated state and get uh, keratinocytes, fibroblasts, hepatocytes, human, to turn on muscle genes if exposed to the mouse. Uh, muscle cytoplasm. So yeah, it was pretty exciting. And um, it was actually met with a, a lot of excitement. I was invited all over the place. <laughs> and, and, and people were, um, it, I was, I was lucky, I think it was uh, recognized quite early um, with three publications in cell and then the frontiers in biology article in in science. Uh, on the cover. And uh, that was lucky because that got me tenure, <laughs> that kind of recognition, because there were skeptics at Stanford for sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm grateful that <laughs> reviewers <laughs> saw it. <laughs> you chipped that, that 
you know, dogma or when you break down that dogma, do you are you thinking at the time? Well, if if this isn't true, then you know, throw out the whole the whole bit, right? Do you do is it did it? Do you have an inkling about like? No, I really didn't realize you could go all the way back. What I wanted to show, I was inspired by John Gordon as a grad student. And I wanted to find out whether the kind of plasticity he showed could be true for mammalian cells. And I devised this strategy with the cell fusion uh, system for looking at changes in differentiation. But um, no, I, I didn't realize that you could do that. And um, since then, we have validated it by uh, fusing embryonic stem cells with other cell types and turning on the uh, embryonic genes, which fits with the findings later. Um, mm. Yeah, so <laughs> that was taking it even further. That's true. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you also for just being so fearless in the science that you do. I think it's something that's persisted over the the years in your laboratory. It's something that I've admired from afar, you know, as, as I was a grad student at Stanford as well. I mean, you're not afraid to step out of your comfort zone and also collaborate at a place like Stanford, which is, of course, a very very collaborative place, as we'll talk about in a little bit. I mean, speaking of those collaborations, your your lab actually had a, a cell stem cell paper recently focusing on CD47, which is this famous don't eat me cell surface receptor that's been so heavily investigated at Stanford by other folks like Irv Weissman and so on as a potential cancer therapeutic. I mean, this was a different angle to the CD47 story where we actually show that elevated CD47 expression is a hallmark of dysfunctional aged muscle stem cells that could be targeted to improve gener regeneration. So tell us a little bit more about this work and maybe a little bit more about its downstream translational potential for maybe enhancing muscle repair. Yes. So uh, Irma Linda Propilia in my lab um, did this study. She did a screen looking for uh, cell surface markers that could be associated with muscle stem cell dysfunction with aging. Uh, because we had shown that the function of the stem cells declines with aging, two thirds are dysfunctional in the aged muscle, uh, but we had no way of isolating the cells and characterizing them further. So she was looking for a cell surface marker and it was an unbiased screen and uh, CD47, to our surprise, came out as the, really one of the top hits and allowed us to purify these cells and characterize the cells and uh, look at their signaling. And, and we found that if you block CD47, if you knock down the levels with, with morpholinos, you enhance engraftment. Uh, we showed the signaling pathways involved. And, and I do think it has uh, potential therapeutic implications because it suggests that the anti-cancer strategies may also be um, anti-cachexia, muscle wasting with cancer because the same strategy uh, stands to enhance the function of the muscle stem cells and, and lead to a strengthening of the muscle. That has to be proven, but, but it's, it, it's got that potential, so. Hmm. Yeah, so we're talking about uh, therapy there, and I think we, we all understand how essential muscle is to life and function, and, and you did us the favor there of, I think, um, articulating the unmet need and how pervasive it is in uh, increasingly aging populations. So we get that, uh, but also a lot of us appreciate muscle for another reason. Uh, the, the omnivore carnivores am amongst us think it's pretty tasty. And with the success of uh, meat substitutes like Impossible and Beyond over the last decade um, and commensurate, if not greater investment being made in, in this uh, generation of cultured meat uh, companies, uh, you know, cultured meats at commercial scale. Um, I feel like it's a burgeoning industry, right? We actually had Mark Post years ago. Mark Post, uh, he was on the podcast, episode 78, for, for anyone who's interested. This was three years after his famous, <laughs> the stem cell burger. I have to laugh because it got a lot of press because, and Mark hated this. The press was all, all about how the burger it was on the front page of the Times. I mean, you're familiar with the Times, Dr. Blau. Front page of the our front page of the science section, $325,000 burger. 
Um, and Dr. Post was very uh, clear with us on the show that at this point, three years later, that they had, in theory, gotten the price down to roughly $10 a patty. So exponential gains and efficiency there. Uh, but this is seven years ago, right? So we're seven years later, and I'm not sure where Mark Post is there, but we're pretty close. At ISSCR, uh, Paul Burge bending my ear about he's generating cell culture media that's cheaper than bottled water, as he said. And I think that's the bottleneck, right, is the expense. Um, and it seemed like all the all the tech displays on the floor at ISSCR had some big, uh, you know, uh, what do you call those um, bioreactors groaning away, circulating something? Um, so I have to ask because I saw digging uh, on your website that you actually had a grant um, with your collaborator Sarah Hellshorn uh, looking at cultured meats. Um, what is what are the outstanding issues to making it practical? Uh, you know, you work in in meat, essentially muscle, right? So you understand more than anyone what the true article looks like. What what do you think the industry needs to do to make it practical at scale? And what is your uh, okay. project about? Yeah. So recently, Stanford developed a sustainability institute, and they put out a call for grants. And my colleague Sarah Klauschwein, uh said, "Hey, we." We've collaborated for years. She's a biomaterials expert and uh, I'm a stem cell person. She said, let's just put in a grant. And I think we have a way where we can put texture in the meat. People don't like it because it has no texture. And so using our biomaterials and my stem cells, uh, we could put that together and come up with something that would be more pleasing to, to people. So we just put this together in like a couple hours thinking that we didn't have a chance anyway. There'd be hundreds of applications, which there were. And we were in the top five. So we got the award. And, and now we are actually doing the studies and isolating bovine stem cells and thinking about how to devise these uh, materials to make it a more pleasant experience because it will have texture. We're not going to address all the problems. A major problem is one of the ones that you've mentioned, which is the cost. Um, and there need to be ways to find uh, serum substitutes and ways to culture meat that will lower those prices. But that's not the angle that we're going to address. We're taking on what we can do best. <laughs> In terms of just theoretically putting costs aside, as someone who, uh, who understands the muscle, do you think that, uh, granted, we're not getting muscles that we need to function, but do you think we can approach the architecture of a muscle with the solutions now? Is it all like bioprinting? Is that, do you think, going to be the prevailing um, method of actually generating the, these substrates? Yeah, I think that'll go a long way. Plus um, the types of, of materials that you put in, not just the cells, mm. but you need to add biomaterials to give you that texture, to give you that substance. Mm. Um, and uh, it's a work in progress, but we have a number of ideas how how we'll do that. It's going to be fun. It's a it's a complete side project, but it's it's a really fun one. <laughs> and you know, if we can do something for the planet and climate change, I think we've all seen this past year uh, how bad it is and how much we need to do something. So we want to do our small bit to try and do something. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very relevant, very important area of study. And I think uh, you're perfectly positioned to to address these questions, um, given your expertise. You know, we're talking about all things muscle. And I, I feel like we have to talk about my favorite muscle as well, which is the heart. I'm certainly biased. I mean, cardiomyocytes are my favorite cell type, and they have a considerable amount of overlap with skeletal muscle cells. And they're both, of course, electrophysi electrophysiologically responsive cells, striated sarcomeres, and so on. But, you know, these two cell types are also affected in muscle degradation associated diseases such as Duchenne's, right? Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or DMD. And the, the, one of the hallmarks there is this severe skeletal muscle degradation, but also that altered dystrophin phenotype impacts the heart. So your lab actually had this PNAS paper recently focusing on my favorite cell type, which is the iPS-derived cardiomyocyte. Like I said, I'm biased. Um, where you showed that this upregulation of the single telomere binding protein, TRF2, 
prevents telomere shortening, restores cardiomyocyte size, sarcomere density, all these great things, improving survival, right? So can you talk a little bit more about this work, this kind of collaborative approach to addressing DMD and maybe also the importance of like telomere attrition in general as a, as a phenotype? So uh, we've been interested in Duchenne muscular dystrophy for a long time. And one limitation is that the mouse model that lacks dystrophin, just like humans, doesn't have the cardiac defect, which is what ultimately kills kids. So we've been frustrated that we couldn't study that until uh, recently. Um, IPS have been converted to cardiomyocytes. And of course, one of the leaders in that field is Joe Wu, whom you know well. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were lucky to be able to team up with him and develop this approach uh, with Duchenne cells. So we were able to get blood cells from Duchenne patients and he converted them to IPS and then we converted them to cardiomyocytes using his protocols and using various biomaterials we developed uh, to promote the function of the cardiomyocytes. And lo and behold, we can reproduce the arrhythmia that's seen in the patient's heart. So it's a really potent um, model system. And so then we could test things that we found both in, uh, in the mouse model and also in Duchenne patients, which was that telomeres shorten even in the cardiomyocytes that are non-dividing. Uh, they shorten with the stress of contraction in the absence of a key contractile protein. And we've done collaborations with the Seidmans and uh, with others to show that this is not just dystrophin, but also titan, also tropomyosin with Joe Wu, that this is true for any missing major contractile protein that's essential to the beating of, of the heart. You see this shortening of telomeres. And that, of course, induces a DNA damage response and is a downward spiral. So, uh, we developed uh, rigorous methods for looking at telomere shortening. And uh, Oscar Aguchi, who pioneered this work and just took a job at UC Irvine, um, she found that she tested the idea that if you could bind the telomeres with one of these Shelton proteins that bind to telomeres, that you could prevent this shortening. And she showed that that's the case and that cell viability is enhanced as a result. I mean, the, the science notwithstanding, I'm just reflecting here, listening to you talk about how one collaborative uh, science is at, at its best, you know, when you're achieving at a high level, it takes a team of killers. And more than that, of how like, I wanna say incestuous, but it's, a, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a small world. It's a small family. You just named the Sidemans, Joe Wu. These are all major mentors of Arun. And it makes you realize that it's a relatively small group. You know, we're, we're shoulder to shoulder. I'm honored to talk to the people I talk to on this podcast, go to the ISSCR and have these conversations and, and you know, just share in, in this collective ecstasy that is science at the highest level with the most brilliant collaborators um and speaking to that i mean I, I was at i was delighted to be in attendance at your presentation of the ernest mccullough memorial lecture during this year's isscr uh, it's, it's one of the highest honors and i think i mean it is objectively one of the highest honors of society and and to me it really reflects that kind of achievement in, in a family it's like it's like a family where we're rooting for each other and being like picking out one of our own and saying thank you for for creating this richness for us all. Um, and of course, a, a testament to to McCullough's seminal demonstration of the existence of stem cells. So that's the caliber of contribution that we're talking about here that you were honored rightfully deservedly for because uh, you've done so much in your career to date, still ongoing. You still crank it in all new directions, like the gerozymes you led with, um, that you talked about in the lecture that was just published in, in Science Translational Medicine just a couple of weeks ago, um, as just one example. And I'm sure that's not all you got cooking. But uh, when you get that McCullough, I mean, I have to say it, uh, it speaks to your generational impact. And, and although you're not close to finish yet, 
it's a time in your career where you you've done enough and you've had enough time to reflect on your own arc, perhaps. Um, so someone who, who's done so much and and left so much behind already, uh, what is the legacy that you hope that that to leave when you finally lay down the proverbial pipette, so to speak? Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> well, if if our finding with the gerozyme translates to humans, that's what I really want to see. I want to see that something I've I've done a lot of fundamental discoveries like the heterocarians reprogramming um, and the telomere shortening. Although we we have a biotech company that's hoping to use that actually telomere lengthening to um, restore function for people. But if I could see translation of something in the lab to help people in the clinic, that would be a dream come true. And, and that's what I'm hoping for with this gerozyme and the drug that inhibits it. Uh, because recently we just found, which is the science translational medicine paper that you just referred to on, came out Wednesday. And it shows that you can restore neuromuscular connectivity. And uh, really, there's no drug known to date that does that. Um, aged mice, if they have caloric restriction, you know, sort of half starved for all their lives, then they can maintain their uh, neuromuscular junctions. Uh, if they run a lot, aged mice, they can restore them. So that's a good thing. Uh, you can do it late and with running. Um, but uh, our drug, is I think the first to show that you can give a short-term treatment and restore those neuromuscular junctions after an injury, sort of restoring the uh, regeneration of the nerve. So it impacts not just the muscle, but also the nerve. The nerve regenerates faster and contacts the muscle and you restore those uh, connections and, and also in aging. Um, so I think that would have could have major implications. There are a number of diseases that are affected by loss of synapses, uh, like uh, spinal muscular atrophy, like ALS. Um, we're hoping that maybe it'll have an impact there, or it could just help people who are older who uh, get a disease like COVID or they break a hip and they are subject to bed rest and it, they're immobile for a period of time your muscles waste so quickly. And when you're older, it's tremendously hard to get it back. It's even hard when you're 40. I know that from my son. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, you know, the older you get, the harder that is uh, to restore that muscle. So if we could give people a boost with this drug, which seems to act to enhance muscle mass and strength in a short period of time, couch potato drug. <laughs> Um, I think they'd be fabulous. Get them back on their feet, keep them out of, uh, you know, um, assisted living and keep people active longer. And you know that your physical function impacts your mental function. And I think the quality of life would be greatly enhanced. And, and that's my dream. And um, I started a biotech to meet that dream as well, just a few years ago. And we're hoping to be in clinical trials in the next year or so in the first initial clinical trials, which is safety, of course. Uh, but that is something I would really like if this could impact quality of life. We're all living longer. Health span is, uh, our lifespan is longer, but health span is still lag lagging. It's more years with chronic disease, uh, like sarcopenia, like muscle wasting. And I would like to uh, contribute to better quality of life and increased health span. That would be my dream. And that this, this drug might have more effects than just on muscle. We have hints that it does, that it affects multiple tissues and might be a broader gerozyme aging associated enzyme uh, than just muscle. And I encourage people to test that and find out what tissues are rejuvenated in response to inhibiting uh, the gerozyme because I think it has pleiotropic effects. Yeah, that's so exciting. I mean, I think um, that is the dream for, for biomedical researchers is, you know, taking a basic science discovery and observation and ultimately over the, the arc of a career, 
turning it into something that can ultimately benefit people, right? So it's so exciting to hear about the, the biotech that you founded. And I can't wait to hear about, you know, how those clinical trials go. You know, we'll wait and see. Maybe we can have you back on the show in, in a little bit to, to talk about that. So thank you so much for, for being on the show. It's really just an honor to, to chat with you. Um, and before we let you go, we wanted to ask you a couple of peripheral questions that we like to ask our guests here about, you know, their, their lives outside of science, for example. So the first question is, if you were not a scientist, and we're so glad that you are a stem cell biologist, what would you be? So I've thought about that. I mean, I have strong hobbies. I love photography, and I love scuba diving. And uh, recently, I've married the two <laughs> and uh, done underwater photography and of coral reefs and uh and these amazing iridescent clams, um, both in Indonesia and in Tahiti most recently. And I, I love that, uh, capturing the life underwater, the colors, the, the textures, the different, the diversity of corals and fishes. And, um, and I've always had an interest in photography and I'm now printing these, these pictures on, on metal and, um, you can, if you visit my office, you'll see them all over the walls. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that's a passion of mine. Another thing I'm doing, I I want people to understand more about stem cells, the lay public. And I realized that one reason, way to reach them is through children's books. People spend money on children's books. They don't spend money on books more, so much anymore, but children's books, they will with pictures and so forth. So uh, with a classmate of mine from Harvard grad school who uh, became an expert in beautiful illustrations, uh, we're, we're writing a, a book on stem cells for children. Um, yeah, and it's tremendous fun. She said to me, we can either do it as an alphabet book or rhyming. And so I decided to try rhyming. And it turns out I, I seem to have uh, a knack for it uh, that I didn't realize before. So I'm writing poetry about stem cells. So the artistic side of me is surfacing <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm getting tremendous joy from that. Who knows if, if it, if the book is well received, maybe I'll, I'll do more. Uh, I, I don't care how well the book is received. I have a three-year-old and I will be the first person to buy that book. I promise you, Dr. <laughs> Blau. So um, I can't wait for that one to go live. And the last question that we have for you here is, you know, I think a really important one for our trainee listeners. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, whether it's professional or not? To balance life, to work hard, play hard. Um, it's very easy as a scientist to get sucked in and feel you really have to work round the clock and, and, and it is an endless job. It's, it's a passion and it's a calling, but it's also a job and uh, you can be totally immersed in it. And it's, it's gratifying, but you know, to get some of your best ideas, you need distance, you need perspective. And so I think having balance in your life, whether it's having children or having hobbies, doing photography, uh, hiking, um, traveling. You need to have an outlet. You need to have that balance. I think it will make you a more creative scientist, uh, more productive scientist. You're not necessarily achieving more by never getting a break. And uh, I think it's very easy as a scientist to compromise those other things. You need music, you need art, you need theater. Um, and you will get ideas from the most unlikely sources. You know, you go to a concert and come out and you have a new idea about your science, which you didn't expect to have happen there. Uh, so I think that's the best advice I can give is that balance. And, and also children seem, you know, to be a huge burden, huge undertaking. I, there's nothing more gratifying than children. And uh, yes, they're demanding, but it is so worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, make time for it, put the energy into it. Yeah, my uh, mentor in uh, my postdoc told me one time, he said, go home, the knowledge you don't have will still be there in the morning. 
Um, and I thought that was it was nice to hear. Uh, and 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 the tail end of that, as you're alluding to, is that maybe you'll fi- figure out a way to get at it uh, once you've stepped away. And I find that that's always the case. You know, in your case, the knowledge will still be there to find when you're back from the dive. Um, so it's really gratifying to, for me to hear that you not only uh, preach that but live it and uh, look at the results. It's all about the results when you're a scientist, right? And I think in this case, they're mostly positive, if not all. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing all these stories. You really are a legend. Uh, I know it's hard to listen to the praise, but you should know it about yourself. You've inspired so many people. And another gratifying thing is to see you're still after that. Just, you know, to change one life, have your discovery go into people, maybe not even knowing that the things that you've done already have inspired and even directly led to therapies that are right now in phase one and and helping people and changing lives. So you may have achieved your goal. You don't even know it, but I understand that we all have that drive to translate every, you know, even one thing. So thanks for uh, reaffirming that for me. It's an inspiration. I think it's an inspiration for all our listeners too. Dr. Blau, you're the greatest. Thank you for this opportunity. (laughs) It was really fun. All right. What a great show. Love Helen Blau. I mean, she's just the sweetest and smartest person I think we've had on the show. Apologies to all you geniuses out there, but she's my favorite. Uh, But it's over. That brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com. Feedback for to suggest guests. Thanks, you guys, for coming out for this episode. Remember, we have a big one coming up in a couple of weeks. I hope you come out for that one. Until then, thank you so much for listening.